Recognize Umbra Walker D01 Recognize Robin B01 Welcome back to the cave everyone and welcome also to our first installment of Secret Origins. In this series we'll be diving into the history of the main characters of Young Justice, um, the heroes, some of the supporting cast, and even the villains. So thanks to the input of over 70 of our listeners who follow us on Twitter at the YJ Files, our first episode is one very close to my heart. We will be talking about the Dick Grayson Robin. Note that in Secret Origins, we will attempt to avoid the largest spoilers, but scenes and story arcs from both seasons of Young Justice may come up, so keep that in mind when you're listening. But I'm guessing you'll be leaving now. Time to move on. Well, Dick, I'll miss you. It's Dan. Dan Danger. Son, you've grown. But some things never change. Like the sight of a Grayson on the trapeze. You can't fake that. Can't hide it. I'll touch on a lot of things in this episode. Specifically, it'll be focused on Dick. But um, we'll be talking about the other Robins, the vast history of this character and how it relates uh, to Young Justice from the animated series uh, that came previous to it and the comics as well. So let's get started. Uh, So Dick Grayson's first appearance as Robin, this is going to be an unusual one because we have multiple first appearances for him. Um, The character of Dick Grayson was actually created uh, by the wonderful and classic team of Bill Finger and Bob Kane. And uh, the look was through the illustrator Jerry Robinson. Back in 1940, April of 1940, with Detective Comics number 8. But there's a second appearance that we need to talk about, and that's the first appearance of Dick Grayson as Nightwing. Uh, Dick Grayson first appeared as Nightwing, shedding his old Robin persona in the epic and classic Judas Contract from Tales of the Teen Titans number 44 back in July of 1984, created by another team I'm super grateful for, which is the George Perez Marv Wolfman run of Teen Titans that made Teen Titans one of, if not the most popular comic uh, of the of that decade. So let's talk a little bit about where Robin comes from, a little bit about his history. So the some of you will be familiar with it and some of you won't. One of the reasons we wanted to do these series is because we were running into a lot of people who uh, whose first experience with DC Comics comes just from Young Justice or perhaps even uh, maybe from Batman the Animated Series and whatnot and may not know these characters in the same depth or history that some others do. Um, Robin's origin is touched on a little bit in Young Justice. It goes in, They go into detail in Batman the Animated Series. But the basic gist is this. Uh, Robin was the son of John and Mary Grayson who were acrobats in Haley's Circus. Uh, Haley's Circus was being blackmailed um, by mobsters, specifically a man named Tony Zuko, uh, for protection money when they did not pay. Tony Zuko uh, put acid on the ropes, weakening the ropes that John and Mary Grayson were doing, were using to perform uh, a netless, high-stress performance during one of the shows. Of course, they didn't have um, Dick join them on that because it was too dangerous, Uh, Unfortunately, that meant that Dick uh, watched his parents pass away. Bruce Wayne was actually in the audience that night and saw what happened. Um, There are various takes on this, of course, since the character is well over 70 years old now. But one of the takes is that Bruce was there because he knew that the mob was um, twisting the arm of Haley's Circus and he wanted to see what was going on. Um, When he saw John and Mary Grayson die, he understood or realized what had happened to their son And of course, relating to that with his own parents, decided to adopt Dick as his ward. They did that, and then uh, he trained him as Robin, and they eventually took down Tony Zuko together. He was originally created, Robin was originally created as a counterpoint to Batman back in the day, and to bring in younger readers back in the 1940s. Batman was originally created to be a counter, to be a parallel to uh, anti heroes from that time, like the Shadow, and even used guns way back in the day. So back in the 40s, a few years after Batman had been introduced and became very, very popular in Detective Comics, they wanted to bring in some younger readers. So they brought in Robin. The character, they have said that he was born in the first day of spring, that his mom used to call him a little Robin, um, talking about his grace and flight in the air. Lots of nods to to that particular persona. But it also gave them an excuse to give him a, an opposite 
kind of color palette to Batman as well. The bread-breasted Robin, the boy Wonder, the smiling, joking, acrobat character that was supposed to be very different than the dark, brooding Batman at the time. Robin didn't have his own series until uh, the second Robin, sorry, third Robin, Tim Drake, took over the mantle. Um, Dick Grayson, the Dick Grayson Robin did have a lot of his own stories uh, back in Star Spangled Comics in 1947 through about 1952 or 53. Which um, leads into this really interesting time in the late mid to late 50s with across DC Comics where these classic superheroes from the 1940s and 50s era uh, like the Jay Garrick Flash, the Alan Scott Green Lantern, and in this case the Dick Grayson Robin was reinvented to become more modern. And this is the reason why we have Jay Garrick even as a character and a predecessor and why we have the Justice Society um, as the predecessor to the Justice League as well. In the case of Dick Grayson, what they did was, uh, and in this time, what they did was they split Earth into an Earth-1 and an Earth-2. Earth-1 is where the Justice League uh, existed and where these modern takes, the Barry Allen Flash and the Hal Jordan Green Lantern, uh, and this Dick Grayson Robin uh, resided, while Earth-2 was the Justice Society Earth. It's the Earth where Jay Garrick was still doing his thing and et cetera, et cetera. And the Dick Grayson of Earth-2 actually was uh, significantly older than the Earth-1 Robin, mostly because they had to deal with the, the time jump between the origin of the original Robin and this new revamped Robin for the 50s. The Earth-2, uh, Dick Grayson, actually grows up, leaves the cowl, stops fighting crime behind the scenes, and actually becomes a senator. Uh, and became a, a pretty interesting character, actually, back in those Earth-2 days before the classic Crisis on Infinite Earths destroyed that that early version of the DC multiverse and mashed everything all together. Uh, back in the 1960s, 1964, the first version of the Teen Titans appeared. They weren't called the Teen Titans, I don't believe, back in uh, the day, uh, but it was Brave and the Bold 54. Brave and the Bold was a series that obviously gave the most recent uh, Batman animated series, or one of the most recent Batman animated series, Brave and the Bold, its title. Brave and the Bold uh, was reputed for bringing different characters from different comics together to uh, to fight together. This is before a time in which there were things across the board like the Justice League or the Avengers. Um, a lot of these comics were standalone. The superheroes didn't really know each other, that kind of thing. This is kind of that beginning. Uh, Brave and the Bold was one of those beginning triggers for these crossover style comics. The team uh, of the Titans back then was uh, one that'll sound very familiar. It was Robin, Aqualad, and Kid Flash. Now this Aqualad's very, very different than the Aqualad that you see in the Justice League series. This was the Garth Aqualad that we'll see later on in season one. But what I found was really interesting in doing some research on this is that not only was it the same three characters that we had in episodes one and two of the Young Justice series, but they banded together to stop Mr. Twister, which is the major villain that we see in episode three. Uh, so later, those three sidekicks come back and join forces again, but this time they've got Speedy with them and the Donna Troy Wonder Girl. Donna Troy doesn't make an appearance in Young Justice. Uh, we get... Uh, a different Wonder Girl in season two. It made me a little sad when I first saw that that was happening because I love Donna Troy as a character and I would have liked to have seen her in the original Young Justice series. But of course, what they came up with made a lot of sense. And I'm sure those decisions were made with um, very specific storyline needs in mind. What was also interesting is that second story with them that included Speedy and Wonder Girl was an adventure to free the Justice League from a mind control uh, situation, which was fascinating to me as that plays into uh, some of what we see in the first season of Young Justice. Robin existed, Dick Grayson existed as Robin for a very, very long time across across so many media, so much media. There were black and white serials back in the 40s and the 50s. There's, of course, the 1960s TV show. We had our the movies that shall not be named that had uh, Dick Grayson in them as well. Um, we didn't, unfortunately, get a Dick Grayson in the, the Chris Nolan Batman series, which is actually one of my, my biggest pet peeves and issues with that that particular series. I would have liked to have seen it. We did get a nod to the Robin name, but I, I would have liked to have seen Dick take place in that, in, that, uh, in that series as well. But eventually, Dick decides to stop being Robin. In the 1980s, during probably one of the, the most well-known Titans story arc miniseries called The Judas Contract, at the end, Dick Grayson decides finally that he doesn't want to be Robin anymore and he wants to be his own person. So he takes on the mantle of Nightwing with this fantastic 70s gigantor collar 
it's just a hilarious costume. Go look it up. Now, here's the here's the thing. that Some people ask me where he got his name from. I don't tend to get into it too much because it's pretty bizarre. So they don't really talk about Nightwing as anything other than just a name he came up with in the modern day. But the actual original origin of the Nightwing name was because... Uh, Robin and Batman had done taken some adventures in the bottled city of Kandor. If you're familiar with the Superman mythos, Kandor was a city that had been taken from Krypton, um, shrunk, and put into a bottle by Brainiac. Um, that particular story arc is kind of nodded to in a few different animated series. But the bottled city of Kandor has survivors of Krypton in it. They're just miniaturized. And periodically, Superman, Jimmy Olsen, some other characters would go into Kandor to solve a problem or do something. But in Kandor, Superman has no powers because they actually, for some reason, use a, I don't know, a red sun light or something. Anyway, while he's in there, Superman and Jimmy Olsen would periodically take on the persona of Nightwing and Flamebird. These were actually supposedly deities from Krypton. The names were used for various uh, crime fighters and, and personas over the ages. But at some point in time, of course, in the 70s and 80s and whatnot, Robin and Batman had gone into the bottled city of Kandor and had met the Nightwing and Flamebird from there. So when he wanted a new persona, Robin actually took on that name Nightwing instead. Uh, Nightwing continued to work as a leader for the Titans for quite a few years, and then eventually broke off on his own, becoming the protector of what was supposed to be kind of a neighboring city slash suburb of Gotham, Gotham's worst child, Bloodhaven. That went on with Nightwing's original series of his own, uh, and then Dick Grayson ended up moving on to other places. He went to New York, he's been in Chicago, at one point, he worked as a police detective. Uh, in his most recent Grayson series, he actually became a, a, a secret agent focusing, a uh, secret agent 37 undercover in a group or organization called Spiral that he'd been recruited into. And that was because his Nightwing persona had been outed. People thought he was dead. So he had done some other things. Some of that has been retconned and tweaked a little bit with the DC Rebirth. He is back to being Nightwing, but he is apparently still using a lot of the kind of secret agent-y skills that he picked up while he was Agent 37. I have to admit, I'm not as up to speed on the DC Rebirth version of Nightwing, so I'd love to hear more about it if some of you are following that series and hear more. So when Robin left being Robin in nineteen early 1980s, it was huge. It was a big deal. I was 14 when I read Judas Contract, and I was blown away that there would be no more Robin. Pretty quickly after that, they introduced the character of Jason Todd, who would be the second Robin. Jason Todd was a street urchin who, during one of the incarnations anyway, was found by Batman stealing the uh, wheels off the Batmobile, and he was much more rough tumble. They wanted to make him not Dick Grayson, unfortunately, because I loved Dick Grayson so much, I just never cared for him at all. He he didn't listen. He wasn't he wasn't really trainable. He was rough around the edges. He just wasn't a great character. Um, though he later evolved into a fantastic character in the modern tellings of him, that character was bad <laughs> back in the day. In fact, when they started writing the there was a four issue miniseries called The Death in the Family. They had a voting. People could call in, spend fifty cents on a told number to vote as to whether or not Jason Dodd should live, Todd should live or die. And I'm proud, disturbed. I'm not quite sure how to feel about it these days uh, to say that I shelled out my 50 cents and voted for him to get snuffed because I just didn't like him. I was kind of hoping they'd bring Dick back, but uh, I'd love Nightwing at that point in time so much too. I didn't know, I didn't know what to think. So one way or the other, Jason Todd dies uh, in that particular series, which we see a nod to in Young Justice. Between uh, seasons one and two, apparently Jason Todd existed in the grotto where they have some um, holographic memories of fallen team members. One of them is uh, apparently Jason Todd and is also nodded to when Dick Grayson as Nightwing tells asks Tim Drake not to die on his first mission, which is a specific reference to Jason as well. After Jason Todd died, uh, killed by the Joker, if you want to see more about that, you should uh, pick up the movie Under the Red Hood. Um, the opening scene is one I never thought I would see in an animated series ever, and that is Jason Todd dying at the hands of the Joker. It's brutal, and it's very well done. Um, there was no Robin after that for quite a while. Um, I don't think the writing team really knew what to do or, or what the purpose was. Um, Jason Todd ended up not being a very popular character, so they didn't know how to fix that. 
But the character of Batman became darker and more brooding. It was the 90s. Things became really rough. Everybody loved the antiheroes of uh, Punisher and um, Wolverine and whatnot. Um, but that just wasn't Rob- It wasn't Batman. He wasn't a murderer. So they introduced the character of Tim Drake. Um, Tim Drake shows up in the Batcave one day. Uh, young, I think 10-year-old at the time, maybe 11. Um, shows up in the Batcave because he has deciphered who Batman is. And the way he did that was because he was actually a kid at the circus Jason, when Dick Grayson's um, parents died. And watching news broadcasts, uh, some you know recordings of Robin and Batman in action, Tim Drake, who is a brilliant, brilliant kid um, with a near photographic memory, could see that the acrobatic maneuvers being used by Robin were the same as Dick Grayson. One thing led to another, and he realized that Batman must be Bruce Wayne. So he breaks into the Batcave. Of course, Batman doesn't want him to be there. And the reason Tim did it wasn't just because, hey, I want to see my idol. He did it because he was worried, because he had seen Batman going down a dark path. And he was convinced that Batman needed a Robin. Whether that was him or not going to be him was almost irrelevant to Tim. It was that Batman needed a Robin. He needed something to ground him in humanity. Um, Bruce was incredibly reluctant to bring Tim Drake on. And in the comics, when I remember reading them back in the day when they first came out, it seemed to take forever before Bruce would let Tim move forward. Um, This is when they introduced the new costume. So the costume that we see in Young Justice is actually not Dick Grayson's, obviously, original kind of Robin Hood-ish nod costume. It's actually the costume that Batman designed specifically for Tim Drake. It has body armor. (laughs) It's got uh, survival gear and equipment far beyond what Robin had. You still have the yellow inside cape, but you've got the darker black outside cape. You've got the um, kind of ninja looking boots that allow for more mobility and grip. It was a significant and much needed modern improvement on that costume. And there was some confusion when Young Justice came out. Like some some fans I noticed, uh, they were confused, or at least they said they were confused. They just assumed the Robin in Young Justice was Tim because of the costume and because this Robin was a computer genius. Um, And a a significant difference between Tim and Dick and how they made Tim uh, a different Robin than Dick was that, um, you know, Dick was created in an era where there weren't computers. Um, And Tim was in the 80s and 90s. Of course, that was becoming huge. So Tim was a hacker. Tim was was the, the intellect. He was the equipment guy. He was the the thinker in a different way than Dick was. Dick was the charismatic gladiator that plays to the audience. He's the the the, the man who knows how people feel and think in a, in a way that Batman never really can, or in a different way than Batman can. And Tim wasn't Jason Todd either. He wasn't a street kid. He wasn't rough and tumble. He was physically fit, but he wasn't he wasn't an acrobat or a martial artist. So Bruce was pretty reluctant to introduce him to the field. And in fact, at the time, both, um, oh gosh, was both of Jason Todd's parents alive? I think they were both alive at that point in time. It may have just been his dad. You have to excuse me on this. Um, his dad does end up getting killed later on in uh, that particular story story arc, but that isn't really his main motivation. It puts a, a, an enmity between Tim Drake and the villains of Batman. But he spends much more time being trained by Lady Shiva. This is the first time we see Robin with his own anime, with his own animated, sorry, his own comic series, um, which I loved and thought that it was great. I really appreciated Tim as a character, how much he wasn't Jason, and also how much he wasn't Dick Grayson. So Tim goes on in his own series, which was excellent for a while, and then of course he eventually wants to go off on his own as well for a number of reasons in the story arc. By that time, he's met Stephanie Brown, and Stephanie Brown was the daughter of a villain named the Clue Master, and she styled herself a kind of vigilante superhero called Spoiler, who would go against her father. And uh, she and Tim Drake uh, hit it off. They were kind of a couple-ish for a while. And when Tim decided he was going to leave being Robin and decide kind of what he wanted to do with his life, Stephanie took over the mantle of Robin. So Stephanie Brown is the fourth Robin. Uh, In the comics, Stephanie was killed. Um, Not long after she took over the mantle of Robin, actually, she was shot and killed. I I highly recommend, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, 
there is a fantastic actual play podcast from the One Shot Podcast Network. It's a series called Flight of the Robins. James Damano did a brilliant job of tying in the histories of all of the Robins and Batgirls um, together into into a fantastic adventure that uh, I listen to again and again. And Stephanie is in this, but uh, not as Robin, but as Batgirl, because uh, as the series goes on, her murder, as happens a lot in the comics, was retconned to be a fake, and she ends up taking on the mantle of Batgirl for, I believe, about two years, and uh, it was actually a fantastic, fantastic version of Batgirl. But that left another opening for Robin, and in this case, we finally get to find out a seed that was planted gosh, way back in the 80s, in one of my favorite one-shots of Batman back in the day called Batman's Son of the Demon. And that is where we kind of get the storyline of Ra's al Ghul wanting Batman to take over his mantle, where he talk, calls him the detective and the relationship between Bruce and Talia develops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in that story, way back in the day, what is that, Oof, 30 years ago now, at the end of that story, we find out that Talia has a son. But that storyline was dropped. Nobody wanted to pick up that thread for decades. And then we discover that Damien has been raised by the League of Shadows and that Talia, depending on the storyline you're looking at, wants to remove him from that influence and place him in the hands of Bruce. So now Bruce has, a, has an actual son that he doesn't know that much about who was trained by the League of Assassins to be a killer. Damien is the fifth and current Robin, although again, I'm not as familiar with the rebirth cycle now, and I'm not sure where Robin, where the Damien Wayne Robin fits into it, and I'd like to learn more, a little bit more about that as well. I was not a fan of Damien at first. I felt like he was going to be another Jason Todd, he was going to be another Buck the System, I don't care, I don't want to learn, I don't want to grow, I don't want to change. And that's when I realized that was my main problem with Jason Todd. It's not who Jason Todd was, it's that he refused to grow. And what I've seen of Damien so far has been pretty fantastic, where he has learned lessons, where he's wanted to grow, where he's wanted to become more, where he's found that the Bruce Wayne Batman is maybe someone he does want to emulate more. And the relationship between Damien and Dick, for example, is really quite interesting as well. And then reflecting back on Dick again, the fact that Dick has basically had several adopted brothers. Jason Todd's death affected him heavily. It was Jason was basically his adopted brother. And Damien is his brother, except Dick's the one that's adopted in this case. So there's a long history of the character of Robin, what he's meant, uh, or she for that matter, and the place that that character fits in the Batman mythos, but not just to be a reflection of Batman, but to be their, his own hero. And I think that gets reflected in the Young Justice series beautifully. So back to Dick Grayson, we'll talk a little bit about his power set. There's not much power set to talk about with, with, uh, with Dick, just simply because he doesn't necessarily have any superpowers. In this particular case, Robin slash Nightwing is a master of multiple martial arts, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, Shaolin Kung Fu, ninjutsu, karate, capoeira. Pretty, pretty heavy emphasis on Aikido in redirecting energy and pinning and stopping people without hurting or killing them. And he's also well known for his Eskrima sticks. Eskrima is another form of martial art that uses two short kind of Joe staffs in combat. He can use them to disarm. He can throw them, uh, a la some other, uh, other heroes such as Daredevil and whatnot. And then he uses significantly less gadgets, fewer gadgets than uh, Batman does. He has some um, kind of modified batarangs. He calls them, they're often called wingdings, which I just hate. But then he also has uh, jump lines. He has gas capsules. He has a few other things that he uses, but he really, really depends more on his own strategy, his own tactics, and his own abilities. He's obviously a master acrobat. But then, of course, he was raised by Bruce Wayne, so the man's got some education. So, of course, he's fluent in English, French, Spanish, Russian, Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, Tamarin, which is the native language of Starfire, Cory from the old Teen Titans, who he had a long, long-standing relationship with, uh, also American Sign Language, and his what's referred to as his native tongue, Romani, as well. And one of the things that makes... Dick Grayson so much different than Batman is this this kind of two sides of the same coin ability to lead. Batman leads because Batman is listened to, I should say. People listen to Batman because they know that he's he's 10 steps ahead of everyone else. You do it because not doing it is stupid. You listen to what Batman says, you process what he says, and you expect that. You do what he tells you to do. 
because he tells you to do it. Dick Creason is a leader not because you do what he tells you to do. He's a leader because you want to do it. Dick Grayson is a leader that inspires confidence, not just in his own skills, but confidence and strength in the people that he's working with and the teamwork that he inspires in them. People follow Dick because he inspires them and they want to do the things that he's saying. They trust him in a way that people don't trust Batman. It's different. Um, I mentioned in, a, in an episode that uh, one of my wife's relatives had asked me offhandedly who my favorite superhero was. Now, he clearly didn't read comics, so when I answered Dick Grayson, he didn't know who that was. <clears throat> and I said, oh, it's the first Robin who grew up to become Nightwing, and he was completely confused, <laughs> adorably confused, uh, and very sweet man. I love him dearly. He was like, I don't understand. Why would you like Robin? He's just the same as Batman. Why not like Batman? Of course, I asked him first, how much do you really want to know about this? And he said, oh, I'd love to hear about it. So... 45 minutes later, he understood the significant difference between Dick and Bruce as a character and many of the reasons why I love him. So let's talk about Dick and a reflection of Young Justice specifically. I nodded to some of these things earlier. Obviously, you have to have a modern version of, of Dick Grayson for the show if you're going to use Dick. And in that case, he has to be a hacker, which means you have to basically combine Tim and Dick into the same character. Now, they did the same thing in Batman the Animated Series as well. Which is why in Batman the Animated Series, when we finally meet Tim Drake, Tim Drake is not Tim Drake. Tim Drake is much more Jason Todd in the Batman the Animated Series. And Jason Todd didn't exist because they had to make Tim Drake different than Dick. And Dick was already an acrobat with the new costume, with the martial arts and the um, computer hacking skills that had previously been nodded to um, Tim for. I already talked a little bit about Tim's costuming and why it changed after Death in the Family, mostly because it's more heavily armored and less sticking out in the darkness uh, where he can be shot and killed. They carry that over really well in the series with Dick disappearing in the night and his camouflage, various camouflage outfits as well kind of reflect that too, which I think they probably did as kind of a nod to the toy industry, but that didn't get, you know, like Arctic camouflage Robin or whatnot that just didn't really get supported very well, which is unfortunate because the reason that we don't have a season three is because the toy line didn't do very well and wasn't very well supported, so they didn't have the money, which is unfortunate. We talked a little bit in the first season, the first episode about Dick not being the leader in Young Justice until uh, we see him in season two. And this bothered me, and I won't recap it much. You can go back and listen to our, our season one. But having grown up my entire life with Dick Grayson being the leader that he is, it threw me quite a bit that he wasn't the leader in Young Justice. But I knew the writers were keeping the heart of the character and telling the story that made internal sense to their universe while still keeping the heart of that character. And it was fantastic. We find out a little bit more about the Haley Circus. We get a little nod to that in the um, fantastic first season episode performance. It also ties a little bit into Tim's origin because we do see Tim Drake as Robin in season two when Haley at the end says, you can't hide being a Grayson on the trapeze. And uh, that scene... I'm tearing up just thinking about it, actually. That scene gets me every single time because that Haley interaction with Dick is a character that circus means so much to him. And in the comics, they do such a good job of bringing that across. In fact, he inherits it at one point. I wanted to see that on the screen, but I didn't need to see a rehack of Robin's origin yet again. I know that some people listening are listening to this particular episode because they don't know the history but I like the richness of these echoes that there is a larger world and things have happened to for the watcher to ponder and wonder and want to find out more about instead of, you know, rehacking a tale that's been told quite a few times. Stephanie Brown. Um, not many people know that Stephanie Brown is actually in the series. She's in Young Justice in season two. She's actually one of the uh, teenagers that was kidnapped by the Reach. You only would know that if you were looking at the credits, though. But it's interesting to me because they may have been setting up either a Robin or a Batgirl for season three. 
I'm not sure if they would have uh, the way that they did the diversity and the support of female cast members in this show makes me think that they might have introduced Stephanie as the next Robin after Tim graduates up to becoming Red Robin, who's the character he becomes in the future. That would be fantastic. If we had Damien too, that would be fine. But a Stephanie Robin, that would be great. Greg Weissman has been adamant about not revealing any spoilers for season three because he still has hopes that we will get a season three. And I um, both hate him and love him for that. So hopefully in season three, we'll either get a Stephanie Brown Robin or a Damien Robin. We'll see Red Robin advance and some of the other characters uh, advance as well. And I'd be fascinated to see if a Red Hood showed up in season three as well, who is the character of Jason Todd as he um, comes back to life. So one of the really interesting things to me, I was on a, um, I was on a Twitter conversation with one of our listeners, Darcy Ross, who was who I'd convinced along with some other friends of hers to watch the series and live tweet while she was watching it, and it was pretty fantastic. In between seasons one and two, she was asking me a bunch of questions because there's a little bit of a time jump, and in between seasons one and two, Dick as Robin becomes Nightwing. I explained to her a little bit of the history that Dick Grayson had become disillusioned with Batman and what that what they were doing and. What what was happening and who the Batman was and what he represented. Um, kind of had that teenage rebellion and then decided to go his own way. In Batman the Animated Series, it's actually a physical fight they get into at one point too. And it's just a very like, they have a very confrontational relationship in the comics and a lot of the animated presentations. So I'd mentioned that to, to Darcy and I had said, you know, this is what happened. And she said, oh, so he, he, he left and separated from Batman sometime in the five years in between. And I said, yes, that's what happened. Um, then Greg Weissman <laughs> actually chimed in and he said, don't make assumptions about what happened in between those five years. And I could not let that go. So he and I got in a bit of a chat about who the Robin is in the comics and that relationship between Dick and Bruce and what he doesn't like about it in the comics. And he never understood why the, the Bruce-Dick relationship had to be so confrontational. You see echoes of it now when you go back and watch season one. The scene where, the now infamous scene where Wonder Woman is calling out Batman for having raised Robin to be a crime fighter from the, you know, ripe old age of nine. With the, you know, her assumed motivation of him to, you know, have this child grow up to be just like him. Have this child grow up to be just like Batman. And Batman's response is, I did it so he wouldn't. This is kind of the most deep core aspect of the Batman character that I think rings the most true that is not up and represented in the comics very well. And then later on in that same season, we get to see not Batman telling Dick, I don't want you to be Batman, be something else. We don't see him telling him to do anything. Robin comes to the conclusion for himself that he no longer wants to be the Batman. He just assumed he would be, and now he doesn't. I can now picture a conversation between the two of them that is a maybe a hard conversation to have, but a conversation they have somewhere in the mansion about what the future holds for who Dick is going to be as an adult, and how maybe they both come to the conclusion that he needs to go do something else. And I want to see that conversation. I want to see comics of that conversation. I want to see an animated series or an animated episode or movie of Young Justice that shows that conversation and transition happening. I love it because it's a much more caring, supportive, loving version of these characters that Bruce really wants to see Dick succeed in life. And I love that Greg Weissman has that vision of him and that he has changed what I want of that vision for those characters. All right, well, I'm, I've been talking for a while now about the character and the history of the character, and I've said a lot about on public public venues about my love for this character and how Dick Grayson, among all superheroes, is my favorite. So I think it's probably time for me to talk a little bit about why Dick Grayson means so much to me. I'm not sure how I'm going to get through this, actually. It's a little... I have to just keep breathing, I guess. I can I can list a number of things that maybe will help you understand. Dick Grayson and I share a name. There actually isn't that many heroes named Richard. In fact, that name is usually applied to someone who's a villain. So growing up, it maybe felt like something that's very simple, but that, that that character had my name. In addition to that, I could relate. It was exactly the reason they created that character, fan service. They created him to draw in younger readers, but they did it, and they did it well. I can't be Batman. 
I'm not rich, blah, 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 blah. I certainly don't want my parents to pass away either way. But when I was a kid, I could see in Dick Grayson someone who I wanted to be. <clears throat> a hero that was inspirational. I was never a dark and brooding person. <clears throat> I had my times of depression, like a lot of people do in high school. But as some of you may suspect, I'm a pretty social person. And so seeing Dick Grayson, particularly as he grew up, I was 14 when he was 18 or 19 in the comics and transitioned to become Nightwing and become his own person. So I was, I was one of the lucky ones. I have an older brother and I have a, I have a dad uh, who loves me very much. But uh, my brother left for the Air Force when I was very young. Uh, my father traveled a lot and wasn't around very much. So I turned to my own friends and other places to be inspired when I was 10 to 15 years old. Dick Grayson leaving the mantle of Robin behind and becoming Nightwing stood as a, as a particularly poignant memory to me about growing up and becoming your own hero. I actually grew up watching the, um, the 1960s Batman show on reruns a lot. In reflection, I didn't really care for that Robin. Burt Ward did a great job. He's a fun character to watch. But that character was far more Jason Todd than he was ever Dick Grayson. People kind of, in retrospect, miss mock Robin for his costume and that kind of thing for that 1960s series. But if you go back and watch it, that Robin was actually representative of a time. Batman was supposed to be the older more mature, calmer, less violent person who was teaching this brash, young, you know, 1960s teenager with no patience how to be an adult. He was always punching his fist in his hands, <laughs> I remember. And though I liked that Robin, I didn't relate to that Robin very much. And it wasn't until that show was gone from memory, and it was the 80s with the Teen Titans revival with um, Wolfman and Perez, that I got to see that person, that I got to be... <clears throat> inspired differently as a teenager. The scene in Young Justice where where Robin is talking to Black Canary <clears throat> and he finally admits that he doesn't want to be the Batman anymore it struck home with me because I remember kind of having my own personal conversation <clears throat> in my own mind when I was in my mid-teens about how how much I loved and respected my dad, but that I didn't want to be him. And that was a much harder conversation than I expected to have with myself. The character of Robin, um, the Dick Grayson Robin, for one of the first times, I think, in comic history, changed and grew. He had character growth and became something else. It was a milestone that hit me at a very uh, impressionable age. And the Teen Titans meant a lot to me because it was about family that wasn't family. It was about Dick Grayson and the other members of the Titans becoming closer. At that time and age, I had a lot of good friends that spent a lot of time with me in my house. I learned about my sense of humor and about my charisma uh, and about my support and love for my friends. I honestly can't... <laughs> I assume those are things that are inherent to me as a person. But there were things I cultivated by admiring Dick Grayson as a character. I hope you don't mind me taking a few minutes to express why the character of Dick Grayson and shows like Young Justice mean so much to me. That the Titans were more of a family than just a bunch of superheroes getting together to fight bad guys. Thanks for joining me for our first episode of Secret Origins. Coming up, fan favorite Aqualad, or at least fan favorite over the last five years. And we'll talk about that next time. You can get a hold of us at the YJ Files on Twitter, on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash crashing the mode, and by emailing us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. I also encourage you to link over to the website, www.crashingthemode.com, to check out links to three fantastic AMVs that are focused on the character of Dick Grayson and the history of the Robins. 
The first one is done by someone called DC is better underscore than you. It is exit wounds and it is fantastic. Another one is from the Red Sox fan 18 to the music of so cold. Also brilliant. And the last one is the liquor is love. Sorry if I mispronounced whatever that's supposed to be. It is a Dick Grayson focused AMV to the song Shattered, which we highlighted by GT Grandum for the entire Young Justice team at the beginning in our first episode, I should say. There are several other ones. Please link and check them out as well. Uh, Dick Grayson gets a lot of love on the AMVs, including Lost Boy by GT Grandum, Numb also by GT Grandum, and more. So link over to our website for links to that and of those and other things, as well as check the show notes. As always, please hashtag keep binging YJ on Netflix and join us for our next regular episode of the Young Justice Files. Stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.